everybody. So there was a huge argument at the table because one person wanted to play the old ranger with the new ranger's abilities and another person wanted to transfer over a lot of stuff from cleric to the new cleric and the dm was like no but then everyone argued yes because wizard said it was back compatible and the dm was like i don't give a fuck we're only using stuff in the new book and it started a whole thing and uh another rogue player's crying in the corner um so so i guess session's canceled I, wait the uh, rogue players crying and not the ranger player you know, I'm confused by it too, frankly. Uh, we've tried to get him to stop, and he just thrashes. So we're just going to let him rock for a bit till he's calmed down. Your times. Yeah. <laughs> Welcome back to the Sessions Cancel podcast, uh, where we will once again. Uh, Fuck you, up. I mean, we could do that. I was going to say, provide you hopefully some entertainment, but no promises. <laughs> yeah, true. But no I promises. Guess you could also one. bang your mom. Um, it's me, Isaiah. I'm here with Josh. Yeah. Uh-huh. And today's episode is um, it's gonna be a shorter one, hopefully, because frankly, like I'm mother. fucking exhausted, brother. What, brother? We're 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 ninety seconds into the episode. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Got it. Jesus fucking Christ. Uh, so today, I uh, this week, really, I, because I'm, I'm prepping for a bigger episode, hopefully in my next batch. But in the meanwhile, I, I was I just kind of had me to be a disappointment then. Damn. <laughs> no, no, a disappointment because I'm, because it's up to because it's up to me for two weeks. And if you're prepping a big one, I, I probably won't. So I'm going to be the disappointment, you know? Oh, okay. All right, that's fine. I can live with that. Yeah. But yeah, uh, I figured now that the new books are out officially, or one of them is. um, One of them. I kind of just wanted to talk about it a little bit, get some opinions, um, some thoughts. You know, I've I've caged the book. Josh has the book. Uh, You know, I don't know. I've heard that, you know, like assholes, everyone has them, so maybe they just pull them out of their assholes. Oh, okay. Uh, but yes, in terms of it the seems book, to be yes, where a lot of those have... shit opinions come from. Uh, <laughs> right. Uh, yes, I am currently holding the Codex Astartes in my hand right now. Yeah. Codex Astartes does not support this action. As opposed to the Necronomicon, because we had the Necronomicon before, but now we have the proper book, so it's you know we have the Codex Astartes, obviously. Yeah, 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 of course. Because there isn't really an opposite to the Necronom. Other than, I don't know, the Bible, I guess. <laughs> yeah, something like that. <laughs> Although there is, I mean, there's an opposite to the Codex of Sardis, the Book of Lorgar, it's the, 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 like, Tissio Divinitatum, the, the Bible that the fucking Traitor Primarch wrote that everyone thinks is the actual Bible. Right, right, right. Real right. fun. If I had planned ahead enough, I might have mentioned that before I said Necronomicon, but it's too late. <laughs> too many weeks deep. It's fine. Many weeks deep. Yeah, so, uh, I mean, Josh, tell the people what they need to know before I get into the nitty gritty. I mean, I don't know if they need to know it, but they should know and they should hit the follow or subscribe button on whatever platform they're currently listening on. Listening on. But I don't know if they need to know per se. No, I need them to know. I will die if they don't know. Well, now they know. Good. I'd live another week, I guess. Yay. I guess. Actually, you know what? Maybe not. Ah, uh, fuck. Shouldn't have told him. Yeah. Damn. Isaiah has ligma. All right. Well, I do. I'm, I'm suffering from ligma. <laughs> <laughs> Let my people go. <laughs> Stay. <laughs> fuck. Uh-huh. <laughs> Oh my god, what the fuck? We're, oh, this is going to be such a scuffed episode. I'm feeling a little scuffed, apparently. That's the mood I'm in. I didn't know that was the mood I am. Yeah, that's what I'm I mean, I, we're both in that mood, apparently. <sighs> anyway, continue. <laughs> yeah, so today's episode is just kind of like, what's what's going on with 5e as a game? Where are we at in the hobby now that 2024 is out? Can we, uh, can we establish how are we a thing? feeling right about there? it? Yeah. We just... Okay. If we say 5e, we mean the original 2014 
version. We say 5e24. That will be reference to the book that just came out, the updated rules, the revised, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Yes. Okay. Oh, I, yeah. So, I was uh, fair enough. Uh, yeah, I was probably just going to call it 2024. Yeah. If we reference the number 24, new rules. Or we just, just, say, we just say the new edition or the new version. I mean, sure, but it's easier to use your just, context. People use your brains. You'll my point it is that We're it's easier to, to use a nomenclature. So if I say 5e24, you know what I'm saying? You know what I mean by that? Yes. It's, it's easier and less of a mouth. That's my point. Yeah, anyway. but, to, you know. Uh, we did no research for this. I didn't watch any videos or do I, I, it. This is this episode is just going straight on vibes. I'm going to be honest. Uh, but we do have the new book to cross reference some like mechanical stuff that we might get into. And to start, I, mean, yes, Josh, I, got, I got a question for you. Uh-huh. Uh huh. Now that 2024 is out uh, and it's finally here and the other books are coming in, you know, in the very, very near future. I mean, well, Monster Man, a little farthest. A little farther. A little farther, but yeah, yeah, yeah. February. Um, I, I feel like we, we should be looking at D&D as a game, um, especially, you know, considering that Wizards just has the inability to go more than two fucking minutes without nuking their reputation. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I mean, so, I, the are, first are, question are, is... Are you saying is, don't bring up any of Wizards bullshit? Just talk about the game as a unit, a self-contained existing thing? No, no. I mean, we're talk, I want to talk about Wizards reputation as well, just as like oh. a... Because that's part of the game, right? Like, if to the a point. If the, I mean, you could talk about the game in and of itself by itself if you wanted to. Like, it is possible. You could, to talk but about it's, it it's as a solo entity. You can, but it's like a. I, I'm. I sort of. I'm curious about the bigger place that D and D five e twenty twenty four has in the hobby, uh-huh. and much like the the Cobellening happening, kind of put Dungeon World in a weird spot, where you know some people didn't even want to play it. Well, did you hear there's news? This is kind that? of a sim. Oh, yeah. I mean, that that someone bought the rights to it and they're making it too. Yeah, yes, I'm actually Luke, really excited. Luke about that. Crane, the guy who the guy who wrote Burning Wheel is making the second edition. Uh, which is interesting because, I mean, Luke Crane's had a little bit of his own controversy, especially because he got in trouble for kind of sort of trying to bring Adam Coble back in the limelight. But he was friends with Adam and Sage and sort of had it was sort of an amicable deal. Version. Actually, fun fact, I, oh, that's post, awesome. I posted on, on Reddit about that happening, and then Sage actually responded to me out of blue, which I thought was kind of funny. Oh, that's awesome. Um, but yeah, it was like a, it was an amicable deal. So I'm intrigued for what it could be. Uh, but yes, I just, that's not relevant to d and I'm just. No, no, I mean, no, that is cool, though. I, I'm happy to hear that. And like, it's cool that Sage responded to you. That's fucking dope shit. It's yes. It's, uh, it's so I, mean, I guess like you know, right off the bat, do you think there's any way that like wizards can salvage what's left of the reputation? I mean, after all the AI, you know, design design making decisions for the game, all the legal bullshit, all the stupid money grubbing antics from Hasbro, it just <laughs> it just feels like this is such an uphill battle. I mean, I guess it depends it, it on what you It will be for so salvage. long, as long as they're dealing with Hasbro. Kind of depends on how you Do you think s- we're going to hit 2018 Wizards for D&D ever again? Like, right after Xanathar's, everything's booming. Oh, I mean, we certainly could. Do I think it's likely? I don't know. I think it's about as likely. I think, I think, but I think there's like sort of two two very broad I mean, it's it's more nuanced than this but there's two very broad situations that could happen situation number one is things sort of continue as is and hasbro keeps trying to nickel and dime le- or left and right and someone in the wizard someone in a higher up position at wizards of the coast sort of bows down to hasbro's make nickel and diming bullshit and you know new controversies pop up i don't know if it's gonna get any worse i don't think it really could get that much worse like I mean, it could get worse in terms of how they're like business practice, but can it get worse in terms of like, you know, Hasbro literally has your dog murdered or something like probably not. (laughs) Uh, Not zero chance, of course. Never zero. 
Um, <laughs> but like, right, right, yeah. I mean, like, uh, they, they could just go weird, like full dictator, and make the you know, yeah, be, be considered a person as the corporation, then become president. But like, unlikely. Um, but like in terms of, you know, it, it could either, yeah, it could either a go mostly kind of where we're on track right now, which has some good, some bad, and you got to kind of deal with it as you go and make individual decisions about how you want to interact. I mean, you know, at the end of the day, you have to tell the company how you want to deal with them via your purchasing. So if you're looking at all of this D&D Beyond bullshit and you're like, please stop fucking with this D&D Beyond bullshit, do what I did, buy the physical actual book to show the company, hey, this good, this D&D Beyond bullshit, not a fan, you know. Um, the other possible scenario is that Wizards manages to a maybe, and I think this is an absolute best case scenario, and unfortunately, I don't think it's super likely, but Wizards maybe potentially breaks away from Hasbro, becomes their own thing, and can do a lot of really cool shit in that space. I think that scenario yeah, is I mean, unfortunately I think right there that, less likely. That, yeah, I mean, that's the Hail Mary pass, like... Everything goes just right, and some very, very wealthy individuals like I'll fucking take it. Yeah, but I think we'll kind of probably waffle. not going to happen. I think we'll probably just waffle between those two things. It's kind of where it's at, you know. Like they they cannot they can't return to the goodwill they initially had unless there is a massive shakeup, like. And by massive, I mean, we get a, we get news that all of the CEOs are fired and Chris Perkins and Jeremy Crawford own the company now and they're not under Hasbro. Like it would be have to be that level of shakeup for them to get the degree of goodwill they had back in like 2014 to like, you know, 2018 ish or whatever. Like that's the only way you're getting yeah. that degree of goodwill back. As long as you're still tied to this Hasbro bullshit, like it's just. Hasbro is just a really shitty parent company. <laughs> you know, like Wizards as a company themselves is not in like is not uh like you know totally hands clean, but man, Hasbro is a really shitty kind of like WB really shitty parent company to be under. You know, like the Suicide Squad situation being a great example, you know what I mean? Oh, yeah, I mean I, I think there's, you know, you're right. Wizards also has its own plentiful fair share of problems. You know, the, the comments that the new CEO of the company made, I'm not a fan of, like, the whole power gaminess that they want new addition to take and how you, you're going to want to objectively just not play older stuff. Yeah, which is, of course, a thing that can go in so many directions. Yeah, I, not a fan of that. Um, frankly, still not a fan about the, the way that the races slash species are handled. I think it was still messy and really reactive. It and, was uh, reactive. I'll say that. It just, it just doesn't seem clean. It just seems like a. It was. It seemed like a knee jerk that was exacerbated by other knee jerks. You know what I mean? I think it was just really fast. They just felt like they had to respond super fast, and so we got sort of a quick and dirty version of what it maybe could have been. But it didn't it didn't land in a place where it like, I don't know, ruined the game or whatever. So fine, you know. No, it didn't ruin the game. But, uh, you know, in that sense, I mean, we've talked about it. Uh, we both like where a lot of the stuff in the game is going. But it is absolutely feeling more homogenized than it ever has been, I think. Yes. And that's a bad thing in of itself. It, I mean, yeah. Obviously, like, yeah. I mean, it depends on what you do with it to a certain degree, but excessive homogenizing is, is almost always bad for sure. But also, 
this goes back to that weird thing where D&D as a game is in a really weird position in the overall hobby because it is the ultimate kingpin of the hobby. It has to be the most homogenized generic game to fit the most scenarios because it is the biggest game owned by a really big company. You know, like it's in a very strange spot that base basically no other tabletop games are in or almost no other are in. So, you know, that causes weird things to happen. It does. It causes, yeah, and actually, it's funny. You bring this up. Go on. Well, I was going to say it causes design restrictions, you know, and some of them not good ones. Yeah, I mean, I'm certainly inclined to agree to that. I think, uh, well, yeah, I'll finish this thought first. Uh-huh. I think you're right. The the clear issue of, well, we, we're the biggest, we're the most accessible, so we can't really branch out too hard or we'll lose our accessibility, but we will have a de- more defined vibe, a theme, a mood going on that potentially more people can attach to because it's more direct, but that's a gamble. And companies don't like to gamble as, until there's a, I mean, it doesn't even have to be a definitive, but like a, a potential... Uh, reward that way outweighs the potential risk. And does that always pan out? No. As we've found out, or as we've known, as companies are now really finding out, talking about the Suicide yeah. Squad situation. <laughs> Except, well, the Suicide that's not Squad situation stop them was, from doing it. That was the complete opposite of a game. Oh? It was, it was it was it wasn't a gamble at all. It was a live service game based on a model that has made a bunch of money for other companies. It was the most dry. We're just going to follow trends type of game they could have possibly done. It was a fucking looter shooter with a basic looter shooter system behind it with a very tried and true battle pass style system and seasons and all that horseshit. Like it was not a gamble at all. There was no gamble about it. The reason it did poorly is because it tried to fo- it followed trends so hard that everyone looked at it and was like, I already played this game in a bazillion other things. The oh, only so interesting. I, to me, it was a gamble because, you know, um, a lot of people compare it to Avengers, you know, and it was, it was almost, it's almost identical to Avengers in a lot of ways. And that bombed, so hard right but you have to keep in mind that the dev cycle of games is so long that the avengers game and the suicide squad game are likely getting developed right next to each other you know within a couple of years of each other and when they started development the the premise of those games didn't seem like a bad idea it's in the same way that Concord, the Concord situation was basically the same thing. Concord, I think they said, was in development for eight years. And eight years ago was right around, if I'm remembering correctly, when Overwatch came out. No, it's literally yes, when Overwatch came out. 2016, yeah. So Concord was in development when Overwatch was ca- just came out and Overwatch was big and huge. So making Concord seemed like a good idea to follow the Overwatch trend but game development takes so fucking long that the trend goes away by the time the game's done, especially when you're in the AAA world. You know, unless you're an indie dev and you could turn shit around in a year, it's like, nah, bro. <laughs> you know, so the suicide, the suicide Squad devs probably, I bet you money, I don't know this for a fact, but I would not be surprised if they looked at the Avengers game, saw what happened, saw what they were working on and went, oh, we're so fucked. You know, but they can't do anything about it. You know, it's not up to them. <laughs> I suppose that's fair. God, have you seen... This is so off topic. Have you seen the concept art for Concord? No. It's actually really cool, and it's really good. And each character had, like, a bunch of personality. And a lot of them looked just nothing like what we got in-game. Oh, well, yeah. that I mean, that happens, though. Concept art is some of the earliest processes of development. It's not that surprising. Um, no, I mean, it's not. But the, the shift of tone, like the original well, art for Concord was uh, it was like Overwatch, but a little more realistic. And we got uh, just dudes in jeans. Well, what we dropped. got was Guardians of the Galaxy. Yeah. 
because again, they were trying to trend chase. Guardians hit big and they were like, oh, our game is kind of sort of in that realm. What if we turn it towards that? So Guardians 1 came out in 2014. Guardians 2 was 2017. So they're looking at Guardians and they're like, all right, Guardians of the Galaxy is big because 1 and 2 were both do both did well. We're kind of doing a sci-fi thing. What if we tilt it more in that direction? But again, eight years down the road, that's a little bit of a different conversation. They also tried to ape things a little too hard with Concord. Like, like the fact that there's a character in there named Star Child is kind of wild. You know, like, yeah. Also, I didn't mean mm -hmm. for that to rhyme, but low math. Um, so, yeah, there's just that's part of that issue. So in terms of gambles, like they feel like gambles because in high, like basically what I'm saying is that those games feel like gambles because hindsight is 2020. That's really what it comes down to. But yeah. they weren't gambles when they started them. It's, it's weird. You know, it's a weird thing. Yeah, I mean, also Dean's art style. It's art direction is ugly like it's just no yes yes i mean art direction wise i don't know exactly what they were t weird decisions were made i will say tying things back to dnd &D, dnd &D has the same problem right like dnd is the biggest tabletop game and as such it is the slowest moving ship right like you know a single indie dev, you know, the 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 creator of Shadow Dark, whose name I, I'm blanking on her name, but the creator of Shadow Dark, if she wants to be like, oh, I'm doing a huge update, she can just do it, you know, like she could just start doing it tomorrow and have it out in a couple of months and boom, bang, boom. D and D uh, is Kelsey a, Dion, huh? Kelsey Dion, is yeah. Uh, D and D. I just figured we'd shout them out. Oh, I mean, yeah. fair, fair point. Yes, Kelsey. Dead. I mean, Shadow Dark, if if anyone entirely unrelated side note, but should, I like, you know, talking about other games. Uh, Shadow Dark is a a OSR, which means old school revival style game uh, that uses a lot of base mechanics of 5e, but is much lower, lower power, lower stakes, grungier, darker more in the style of really old school RPGs where characters died more often and monsters were much more dangerous and stuff like that. Much less heroic fantasy than d and is. Um, and a lot of big, a lot of designers in the tabletop space uh, praise Shadow of Dark quite a lot. Um, but anyway, d and uh, is the slowest moving ship. So D&D also has the same problem that video games have where D&D follows trends, but it's, you know, several years behind. Like, mechanically, if you look at the game design that 5e is executing on, even in 5e24, it's behind the curve compared to so many other tabletop games that have taken the same problem that D&D is trying to deal with and have already solved it in a way more elegant and interesting way. And 5e is just like sort of kind of catching up to some of that stuff a little bit, but like not really. You know what I mean? Do you have a do you have a for instance just for them? For the oh, first? God. Um, I, I can't pull from a... Well, I sort of can, actually. So, like, the crafting rules being kind of an example, right? D&D gave us these kind of janky, weird crafting rules, both in base 5e and 5e24, and they just feel really outdated and old school, where it's like, oh, you calculate the gold, and you use the gold to come up with a number for how many days, and if you use X amount of people, you could speed it up this, this pace and stuff like that. And most more modern RPGs are like, cool, here's a tracker of some kind, a countdown number, a, a, a number of roles, something of this nature. Uh, you need this many, you need to fill up the counter this many times for a project based on how difficult it is. Like, it's just, just more, it's a more simple gamified system that gets to the point but still invokes the feeling. 
Whereas 5e still kind of tries to do this weird thing where they're like, oh, well, it's we're trying to simulate real life a little bit. Whereas most table, most modern tabletop games have stopped trying to do that thing where you simulate real life. You know what I mean? Like the idea that you need to have a rule for every little real life interaction or the idea that like you need, you know, like, oh, God, what's a good I can't think of a good example. The idea where you're trying to you're trying to translate actual interactions into game systems. So like, a, you know, armor class. Actually, no, armor class is a bad example because armor class is, is actually uh, a symbolic system as opposed to like a more literal system. Damn, I can't think of a great example now, but. You know what I mean when you run into it, where there's just there's too many rules that are trying to account for every real life minutia thing that could happen when most modern games these days say, here's the system, here's how it works, here's the here's the gamification of it, and then in the fiction of your game, you can translate it to look like whatever you want, right? Blades in the Dark doesn't make you calculate money and do an amount of hours and a number of days to decide how long it takes you to craft this specific item you do a question and answer ad libs thing with your GM to de to decide what your project is. And then you make a number of roles and you fill up a bar, essentially a meter, a countdown clock to decide when the project's done. It's very gamified. It's very gamey, but fictionally you just translate it to however you want. Whereas D and D is trying to like mush the fiction and the gamey together and make them one in one. But that almost always is clunky and not really a thing people do anymore or want anymore. You know, that was a long way. Yeah, yeah, I see what you're saying now, for sure. <laughs> the point I'm yeah, making... I mean, I think that's really fair. The <laughs> point I'm making is that D&D &D is often slow and behind on trends in terms of tabletop space, in terms of, like, design, the design space. Apparently, the warp internet demons have returned, but they have been banished for the time being. So, yeah, Josh, uh, as I was saying previously... If you could dethrone D&D uh, &D as like the, you know, go to tabletop for most people to like most common parlance and TTRPGs, would you? And if you did, what would it be and why? Uh, I personally don't have a good answer for this. I've thought about it like literally all day. Um, I, I don't think I have an answer, frankly. I do have an answer, although it's maybe maybe a little bit of a cheating answer. Depends on how you go for it, how you take it. Um, yes, I would dethrone 5e because I think D&D &D is too, it's got too many, it's too beholden to its past, it's too attached to this big company, it's too attached to its brand, so I don't think it being the intro tabletop game is particularly healthy. Like, it, it's kind of a half joke, but I saw some, I, I forget where I saw it, but I think it was today, actually. I saw someone make a post that they were like, yeah, I was having, I was getting a friend into Vampire the Masquerade, and I explained oh, yeah, everything I saw this. about their, the setting and everything, uh, uh, you know, and they seemed really into it and everything, and then the character they brought me was an elf druid for session one, and it's like, yeah, that... That's like, oh, the, the comparison somebody was making, they were like, imagine if you met someone who only consumed Batman material, like, and nothing else. <laughs> and then it's like, you hypothetically could do that, but you'd have a very skewed perspective on what, you know, pop culture media is like if the only thing you consume is Batman material. Okay, now that's basically tabletop, but with D&D. &D. Um... Now, that's going to be the case no matter what, right? There's always going to be the intro thing that sort of get like it's a, you're going to have a skewed opinion of how a certain media is based on the first version that you interact with, right? If the first video game you play is Call of Duty, you have a certain opinion of video games versus if the first video game you play is Kingdom Hearts. Um, but D&D has such a stranglehold that it's influencing like 90% of the player base and 
That wouldn't inherently be a problem, but I think the game is sort of stuck in some of its archaic ways because branding, right? Like there's certain things they won't get rid of because of the brand, right? Uh, stat modifiers, the D20, you know, like the classes, like there's things they will not get rid of. They will not budge on because it's part of the brand. So because D&D is so beholden like that, I would dethrone it. And uh, quite frankly, I would replace it with a game. And I'm not saying this game specifically, but I would replace it with a game more like Dungeon World. In terms of it's still a fantasy game, it still has some of that like sort of fantasy heroic elements, but I want it to be more open ended, more fictionally focused, less mechanics first and to not be so beholden to an old school brand designed by a dude in the 70s who had some cool ideas, but, you know, his ideas have been updated and iterated upon. We don't need to beholden ourselves to Lord Gary Gygax, the patron saint like, you know, things have changed. We've evolved the hobby in the same way that we don't make all video games exactly the same as the original Mario, just because, you know, that was one of the most famous video games back in the day, you know, like things mm -hmm. get updated. Um, so I would rep I actually a, a kind of a good modern example is kind of a game like Daggerheart. I would replace it with something more like Daggerheart. Oh, now you again, know probably I not even thought about Daggerheart. Like Daggerheart, go on. Not not 100%. I think there's elements of it that that make it not a good intro game, but I think it has a lot of strong elements to be a good introducing game. Yeah, yeah. I mean, no, I think you're right. I think Daggerheart has just enough uh lol do whatever you want going on for lack of a better phrase. Yeah, because but still has some really interesting and thought-provoking ways of handling the game. So yeah, that's fair. One of the best one of the one of the best ways to get people into tabletop, right? Because it's such a strange it's a hobby that has very little comparison to any other hobbies. It's kind of a board game. It's kind of like a video game. It's kind of like playing make believe. It's it's kind of like playing, you know, it's kind of like when you picked up sticks and pretended they were guns when you were like five, you know, like it's it's a weird hobby. It's hard to explain. So when you introduce someone to it, part of, you know, the sales pitch is often you can do whatever you want. And then you try to do whatever you want, and then D&D &D tells you, no, you can't, in fact, do whatever you want, right? Like, you can, but also you kind of can't at the same time. So, yeah, what most people end up doing when they're introducing new players is the new player describes what they're doing with no, uh, no, uh, not understanding, no, um, they don't shackle themselves with the rules. I, I don't know what the word I was looking for there. You know, they don't shackle themselves with the rules in any way. They just describe what they're doing. And that's it. They just say what they do. And then so you as the GM get in the situation where do you tell them no and then explain all the rules minutia or do you just kind of make it work in the moment to keep them interested and say, yes, you can do that. But, you know, we have to make an adjustment here or there or whatever. And, you know, generally, I think saying yes, but uh, is probably the move. But there is a little bit of that caveat where you say Yes, player, you can do this thing, but you have to do X, Y, and Z, and we're kind of breaking the rules here. The problem is that that player is going to keep trying to do that over and over again until someone either tells them no finally or they learn the rules themselves. But someone could tell them no, and then they could be like, eh, never mind, fuck this game. You know, like, they're going to butt up into the rules at some point. So you could be growing a bad habit, but at the same time, you don't want to crush this idea you don't want to crush the imagination and the interest because that idea of do whatever you want is a big part of it so you have to foster the interest but also keep in mind there's some back-end caveats so a game that's more fiction first like a dagger heart like a dungeon world helps you a lot because that game is already trying to do that in its base rules so mm -hmm. that's what i would replace it with and I'm not and, and, you know, like there's still a place to have your D&D &D style, like tighter rules, your pathfinders and all that. That still can exist. But yeah, I don't think it's the best way to introduce, especially combat like D&D &D combat is so not intuitive as a new player to tabletop. It's, you know, like it's just it's strange if you've never interacted with the hobby it's very odd and if you've never played board games let's say you're somebody right you have a you have a friend who's a huge you're you're a person who's never played DD. 
you have a friend who's a massive tabletop nerd, right? You've never played a board game. You've never played a turn-based video game. You know, you've never looked at a Warhammer. You, none of that shit. D&D is going to be so... Un, like, you're a, let's say you're a COD bro who plays Call of Duty and FIFA and that's it. And then your friend convinces you to play D&D. Some fucking how. Who knows how. D&D combat is going to be... I mean, all of it. But combat in particular is going to be so unintuitive. You know what I mean? Like, it doesn't... It, like, doesn't make sense, really. I mean, I distinctly remember having a conversation with a friend. She was talking about... We were talking about, like, Pokemon. And she was mentioning a, a, a Marvel... I think it was a it might have been a Facebook game actually. I think this was like before mobile games were as big. This, this was when we were in like high school, and she was yeah. like, "I don't get it. It's so stupid that I have to like, because it was a turn-based game, right? So she was like, it's so dumb that my character attacks and then I have to stand there and let my character get punched in the face. Like that's not how fighting works.' And I had to try to explain to her, I'm like, no, that's not literally how fighting works. But the idea of turn base is you're abstracting the concept of fighting and slowing down the individual moments to like represent a symbolic version, right? It's not a literal representation. That doesn't make any fucking sense if you've only played Call of Duty. You know what I mean? Yeah. So like, that's why I think D and D is kind of a weird intro game, and you know, obviously it it's working to some degree, but I think it could work better. You know, I, I saw, I actually, now as you were talking, I've been putting some thought into this. I think I do know what game I would want to dethrone D&D. &D. Okay. And it's not one I think you'd think of when it comes to me. Uh, okay. I actually think Fabula Ultima would be a really good, uh, like a really good swap up for D&D. &D. And I'm going to tell you why. The game, it does put a lot of onus on the GM, right, for things. But it, it also abstracts most things that aren't vital game mechanics. So like like races or species or whatever, they're like we don't have any, you know? If you want to be a dragon person, you can be a dragon person as long as it makes sense in the setting and you have relevant abilities that that help you with that. Uh, or do you want to be like a Lalafell? You can do that. But where the game gives you a lot of really interesting stuff is the way that classes work, the way combat works. And combat's very simple. It's you know, you don't even really have more than one action. You have your action for the for the turn, which which can you know, rather than D and D, where it's like, okay, I use my action. Can I do anything else? And they're like, do you have a bonus action? And you're like, I don't know. What the fuck is that? You know, the way Fabula Ultima does it, it's like, oh, you activate your your like arcane summon. Okay, when your arcane summon is activated, now on that same turn, you can do this thing. And if that happens, then you can do this thing. It shows you a, a clear path from point A to point B and how you do them. There's no real, I don't know what do help. You know what I mean? That goes it's on. It's not as couched in mechan in game mechanical term. Um, yeah. <clears throat> and it, you know, the game is built around building a character your way. Mm -hmm. And it it's very clear that it's like, you know, try things. If you don't like what you're doing, talk to the GM, you know, Usually they should just let you re-switch your class because the whole game is about experimentation. You know what I mean? You don't have to feel locked into things. And that can be good or bad if you have a min-maxing munchkin. It's like, no, game says I can change my class whenever I want, Dungeon Master. And you're like, I mean, yeah. Yeah, if you're struggling and you're not having a good time, that's not free. You, you don't get to fucking Meteor Shadowbringers trailer job switch on the fly, fucker. Yeah, you're not playing 14. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah, I, I can see that. My 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 one caveat still being if it's a turn based game when it comes to combat, I still think that is a barrier. I think that's a pretty tall barrier for a lot of people like. I don't like that people. I'm not trying to I'm not trying to shit on everyone's opinions here, but there's a subsect of people who refuse to play any game that's turn-based because they think the idea of a turn-based anything is stupid, right? Now, granted, you look at those same people and go, okay, so is chess stupid? You know, you kind of caught them on that one. But there's a lot of people that this idea of a turn-based thing they just think is, like, dumb and is automatically bad, right? It's, it's more than just chess. If any board game, I really, mean, any board is turn-based. Yes, like. yes, yes. 
but like you know fuck uno is turn-based like <laughs> right cards yeah all that but people have this stigma again a lot of this is the cod bros or you know the Fortnite kids you know they they have this stigma about this idea of turn-based it's the reason final fantasy has stopped being a turn-based game although arguably final fantasy hasn't really ever been a turn-based game but we don't need to get down that rabbit hole um <laughs> <laughs> so it's like you know, there's there's an appealing to that crowd for sure. You know, more buttons, more colors, more do things, pretty colors, yay, boom, bomb. So I think a big barrier to entry is the turn-based nature of tabletop can be a problem. And if you tell someone, I think it's a it's a particularly frustrating fix, friction because you say to somebody, you can do anything you want. And then they try to do anything where you want and you turn around and say, well, yes, but actually no. <laughs> right. In a video game, there's no uh, there's no promise of you can do anything you want. Right. Everybody knows video games have limitations. One of the big selling points of tabletop games is you could do anything that you want. So when you go to do anything you want and then immediately you're told, actually, I lied to you. Never mind. That causes a very strong like as the kids say you get the ick <laughs> you know oh god <laughs> like you do you get the ick like you get this immediate like oh well that's shitty you told me i could do whatever i want now you're telling me i can't do whatever i want what the fuck dude so taking away that turn-based element and having a game that works like an apocalypse world like a dagger heart like a dungeon world you know that open-ended fiction first style gameplay brings that friction way way down there's still a little bit of like well you can't you know you can't just like fire a laser gun at the sun and blow up the universe or whatever but it turns that friction way down so that's the one that's one thing i think would help a lot if the primary tabletop game people were coming in from wasn't this turn based and it's not even just the fact that D and D's turn based. D and D is turn based and also like tactical focused because it comes from war gaming. You know, like it came from a game called Chainmail, which played like Warhammer. You know, like that's a very specific kind of hobby that a lot of people do not jive with. You know what I mean? Yeah, like a lot of people. Look at something like Warhammer and they're like, cool. So you're moving a bunch of plastic men around and rolling dice and saying that the plastic men are shooting each other and having an epic battle. But you have to have 60 bazillion different rules to have their cool epic battle. And you go, yeah, and they're like, why is that fun? <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. so d and comes from this very weird place that not that many people are actually that into. It's kind of a miracle d and gotten as popular as it has, to be honest. Uh, yeah, I mean, like, I could see that. I think, you I, know, a big chunk of why it's become that way is because people are moving away from the well, rules, everything, and just it turning it into improv, which is that's pretty well, much how I describe D&D &D to people now. It's like, I mean, it's basically improv with a set of rules. I mean, that's how I describe it. That's how I describe tabletop in general. But I mean, it, it is also worth pointing out the game originally was a lot more open ended, too. And then it got more and then it got more focused. And now they're trying to kind of move back towards the open end. Like there's always been a little bit of that, but it's like, I don't know. It almost feels like D and D got popular in spite of the game, as opposed to it got popular because of the game, you know, like it's like a lot of the things that made it popular were kind of outside of the game and the companies control themselves. It's weird. It's a very weird scenario. Don't it, and and a big portion of it is also just the fact it's the oldest one, right? It was the first tabletop game. It was first to the party, so it gets seniority. That's a huge part of it, undeniably, you know? Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, I mean, you're right. I, I think it, it has this weird ability of like, well, we're sort of grandfathered in, to, to, so we're allowed to do weird, not, you know. We're allowed to be kind of stuck in our ways. Yeah, because we're grandfathered in. Well, yeah. right, because it's it's that's the thing, right? It's like, you know, generic cliches suck unless you're the first one to do it, and everyone's like, ah, the good old days. Right, 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 exactly. Yeah, tropes are dumb unless you're the make the one who makes the trope. Yeah, I mean, I. Mm. No, no thought. Don't go. Don't. Oh, I lost. 
God damn, damn it. Uh, yeah, I, mm, I don't know. I, I don't know if, if it's, if I'm, if I'm too, if I agree as much with the turn-based stuff, I think, I think you need to, there needs to be a clear distinction, right? I, like, I feel like D&D doesn't have a good distinction between when you're doing the roleplay heavy, I just want to kiss all my hot friends, and then the, it's time to kill things. I mean, it does. And a lot of people, the initiative it, role. it does, but you know, I don't think that stops as much people as it should. Like, there's, like, I, again, I think Fabula Ultima works because the majority of its rules lie in the combat, and everything else is abstracted. So to me, and I could be wrong about this, but to me, it feels more like, okay, so we're doing combat. It's no longer time to kiss the homies goodnight. It's time to, you know, do my one thing per turn or the thing that leads to other things or my, you know, whatever I can do. And then I wait patiently for everyone else to do the thing. In Fabulous Ultimate's combat's way quicker because you know, the action economy is super simplified, but it streamlined itself. So it, I, I feel like, I mean, I haven't run the game. I plan on doing it at some point. It feels like it should go quicker. It should feel more snappy in a way that like, maybe not Daggerheart, because Daggerheart still felt a little stuffy at times, but we also, it was our first time playing it. So that's fair. Well, it, it feels like it, it could potentially be as fast as Dungeon World, where it's just like, bada, 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 like one thing after the other. I mean, maybe. I don't think the speed is inherently the problem. Though. Especially because, I mean, early level D&D is pretty quick, you know? Um, True, it is, yeah. But, like, that idea that most of the rules are in the combat and then the rest of the game is pretty abstracted, that's supposed to be how D&D works, too. You know, like, most of the rules of 5e are in combat stuff, right? They are combat-centric. But, <sighs> you know, yes, I mean, like, sometimes the game, I mean, maybe it's not as as abstracted as Fabula Ultima, I don't know. But that's why I didn't that's why I didn't necessarily pick any one specific game to dethrone D&D. And I just kind of said a style of game because I don't want to necessarily beholden to any one specific game, but it's just more about conceptually, you know, because any one game is going to have an issue like there's going to there isn't any perfect game that's going to be the absolute perfect beginner friendly. This is the one to get people in like that's just not going to exist. Um, mm. but a style, I mean, I say don't do the turn-based thing, but like, I've heard a lot of people also say Shadow Dark is a really good entry game and that does still have turn-based. It just has significantly less for your character to be able to do mechanically. So, you know, it's sort of like, it's just, it's just most of the, basically because it's, it's very stripped down the most optimal maneuver is very clear, which is I attack, you know, most of the time. Mm. Whereas in 5e, the optimal maneuver, I mean, at lower levels, the optimal maneuver is pretty obvious, but once you start getting a little higher, exactly how to like utilize your turn becomes more complicated. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you're right there. D&D &D definitely has the problem where it's really snappy at the start because it's like, all right, what are my options? Not much. Uh, <laughs> Firebolt? Yeah. Or Firebolt? Firebolt, or would you like to cast, you know, Color Spray? <laughs> yeah. And, yeah, and then later levels, it's like, well, so I'm going to activate my Sukkah mode and I'm going to cast this we'll spell as a bonus this, action, but because I have yeah. this ability, that lets me do this thing as an action, I mean, which will key into this thing I've had running for five turns. <laughs> a game getting more complicated is not inherently a problem. It should. I mean, that makes sense, right? If you've been playing for a long time, you want more stuff to do. That makes sense. Uh, it's just with I don't know, with 5e. Because of the way they've designed the combat rules, there's like pretty optimal routes for you to do like. Because of the way the rules are designed, if your player is like, all right, GM, I'm going to like run and like tackle this guy to the ground and then hold him down so my teammate can attack him. That's just less optimal than you attacking by the numbers. You know what I mean? Yeah. 
so because of that D and D puts you in this scenario where it's like, because of how the math works out, it's like, there's a specific optimal thing to do. And usually that optimal thing to do is pretty mechanical and straightforward. Like you should do this. And then this, you're a ranger. You should cast hunters, mark fire your bow, you know, but shadow dark is the rules are so open that there's not always a very clear optimal thing to do and utilizing like fictional stuff to try and get it to try and get an edge over your opponent actually makes sense you know like <laughs> like 5e kind of discourages you from doing anything swanky you know like improvised mm -hmm. weapon rules exist but like unless you're going out of your way to try and make them work for like a weird character build or something you generally aren't going to use improvised weapons really you know there's no reason for your barbarian with their great axe to pick up somebody to pick up a chair and hit them with it you know what i mean there's just no point yeah <laughs> Uh, so yeah it's it's tldr it's about a style of game i think that would be a better intro game and i don't think D, &D is quite that style of game that's the tldr yeah version <laughs> yeah and i like i said i agree i think that's a very like accurate and fair assessment to make uh but given that D, &D is still kind of locked in are there like in the upcoming books, ones we haven't seen yet, uh -huh. is there any stuff that like any specific mechanics that you'd want added to the game? Maybe that you see in other games or you know, are, are, are there any major revisions that you think you'd want to make either the DMG or the monster manual monster manual that it, to be fair, that isn't the DMG not being a jumbled mess of court of sort of kind of ideas, maybe from a certain point of view. <laughs> I mean, well, yeah, they already that kind of goes without saying. Well, they already said they're working on that. Um, yeah. <laughs> I mean, would you like my answer to be things that I think could reasonably happen or things that like go buck wild? What, what would you do if you could? And because those are two different things. True, true. No, I mean, like if you. Because like we'll, we'll say, you know, full reign, like what what are what do you want to see in these things? You know, I mean, you, whether or not you want them to be subtle or drastic, you know, like well, I said, are there any major revisions that you want to see? I mean, Buck Wild answers that are not going to happen would be like entire rework of the encumbrance system, entire rework of the equipment system, re, re looking at the stats system, uh, redoing the saves, uh, probably reworking how well, subclasses works. Like <laughs> I have huge well, well, overhaul that, that's, things that will not happen, but. No, and I, that's also like major revisions to the, the the player's handbook. I'm talking about like the DMG and the monster man. Well, I I, I mean, major. I, there's all sorts of revisions I would do to monsters like. <laughs> but again, I don't think I like the stuff I have in mind is not things that are gonna ha like I'm talking major pie in the sky. If I had control over it type stuff, you know, like. I'd probably rework sure. a lot of the action economy on how they work on monsters. I would make monsters more uh, more asymmetrical to how player characters work. You know, I would I would probably do quite a big rework on magic items and give like a tier or a level system or something like that because the current like uncommon common rare bullshit is a, a mess. You know, it, it doesn't make sense a lot of the time. I would try and do th like, for example, you know, a, a plus one shield is is rare, but then another magic item that's rare is shit compared to getting that extra AC, which is just like infinitely better. But they're the same rarity, you know, crap like that. Um, in terms of things that I would like to see that I think will actually happen. Um, I mean, we know we're getting the Bastion thing. I hope that that's going to get a little bit more attention because the playtest version we saw was a little like, I mean, you're starting somewhere, but nothing amazing yet. Um, the something with the diseases situation, because they took all that. They took out. They took out any sort of reference to diseases in the classes. So perhaps some sort of perhaps some sort of rework on that particular thing, like some sort of like illnesses or poisons or something kind of going on there. Um, I don't think it's going to happen, but like a poisons 
and like alchemy crafting rework would be nice something like that um this also probably isn't gonna happen but like ways to utilize like monster bits would be cool but again not gonna have the problem is most of the shit i want i don't think is like i don't think any of it's gonna happen really you know what i mean like i just don't like mm. i would love to see a, re a look at the vulnerability and resistance system and don't go too crazy but i think a little bit of a rework to how that is would be nice. It's a little too binary the way it currently works. And I think, you know, for example, you could give a monster a resistance value. So like this monster has re fire resistance 10, which means any fire damage they take, they subtract 10 damage from, you know what I mean? Like, I think that mm -hmm. could be cool. Um, but again, we know that's not going to happen because it didn't change in the player's handbook. And if it's not changing there, it's not going to change in the DMG. So, or the monster manual. Um, yeah, true. We've also seen a couple stat blocks and it hasn't changed. So, um, true. Like, like, like I know this, this, I, I was kind of worried this question would be a little more of like a waste, but like, it is something that I, I was thinking about because, you know, we've talked about a lot of what we want to see in the DMG and how we've seen some stuff that we don't, like 100 percent, or that i you know me and matt didn't like 100 percent with the, the monster manual that you know you and sam liked but yeah it was, i mean i felt like it was worth asking the question regardless i mean as far as i'm concerned yeah i mean the things that i'm i really want is uh like i mean first and foremost yeah i mean the alchemy thing diseases Stuff like that, I I care a lot about that. That just makes the either the the like day to day of quote unquote adventuring more interesting. Things that the GM can provide yeah. to the players. That's not just stuff to break up the same old whack. same old. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And you know the random tables are cool, but a lot of times they're like limited and. and Matt said he's got great use out of random tables. I've never had that much success with them or feel like they're good. But maybe instead more hard coded suggestions for certain well, ways of handling environments like environmental things. Environmental are super cool. Things I care about those good. a lot. We might act um, those. Hell's we might actually those and get. I love them. Like that could Think actually so? happen. Well, yeah, because they're reworking. The oh, DMG. no, yeah, it could happen. I don't. Yeah, yeah, it could because they're reworking the DMG and they had those like those magical phenomenon areas in Tasha's. So like I could see a relook at that kind of thing in the DMG itself. Um, yeah, the, I, I, I mean, a thought. The problem with the, the random encounters is that the game is so combat focused that all the random encounters just boil down to combat stuff, right? If the game was less combat focused, that would help a lot of that. That would help that stuff a lot, uh, especially because the game is still the game itself. Now, I know people don't necessarily play this way, but the game itself is built around this idea of XP per day and that XP curve and how often you level up and all that stuff. And the XP is based on overcoming monsters. The DMG may may offer alternative XP tracking systems. I think that would be great. Uh, but as it is right now, you know, fight monster get XP is the base design. So a lot of the random encounters and stuff just boil down to a fight because at the end of the day, it's like, sure, you could have a random encounter where your players uh, run into some halflings and have a chitty chat and like do a thing and trade with them. But then the players go, ah, oh, well that was kind of a waste of an encounter because we didn't get any XP, you know? Uh, and <clears> that's <throat> sort of an issue with the like core of the game. Now you as a GM can of course fix that self, uh, but talking about just the game as it is, you know, rules as written raw as we were, it's fucking raw. Um, He's fucking raw that can be a problem. And I think that's why a lot of the random, because wizards, when they make random encounter tables are assuming that you're doing a bunch of combats in a day to level your characters up, right? They're, they're making the tables based on the assumption. If they weren't basing it off that assumption, we might get more interesting tables. Yeah. Uh, a thought I did have today earlier thinking about the DMG, because that is the next book we're getting, which by the way, I'm super fucking annoyed about. I would much 
much prefer we get the monster manual second and not the DMG it second. It does feel weirdly out of order, yeah. It's very <laughs> annoying. I mean, if if this was 2014 when 5e was coming out, I would understand why you might release the DMG second. But the problem is we already know how to run and play this game for the most part, right? We're getting a we're getting a refresh. We're not getting an entirely new thing from the ground up. So we already know how to run and play this game. We don't need the DMG that badly, but new monster stat blocks would be great. <laughs> we're just not getting a lot. Of, I mean, we're getting trickles, but not much, you know? Mm-hmm. So that's weird. But something I would like to see in the DMG is those those optional rules, stuff like uh, the side initiative and the, I think the milestone XP was actually an optional rule in there and like the modern firearms and the guns and stuff and like all those little weird optional rules that the DMG had like knocking around. I really want them and I'm hoping they are taking a look at those again because those optional rules in the 2014 GMG were essentially just oh Back here's the book if you saw them you saw them and no one really followed them no not even that I mean that's fine but the, w- in terms of the rules themselves the way they were designed is like like the reason they exist is because the the designers had a couple of ideas that didn't make it into the core game so they threw them into that optional rules section as a way to be like this was a thing we were messing about in playtesting that didn't make it in the core game. But like, if you want to try and use it, here you go. They weren't like really refined optional rules. They were stuff that they were doing at the time that didn't make it to the final product. So they wanted to do something with them. You know what I mean? They're very, they're kind of throwaway, which is why design wise, they feel a little, they feel like a little bit of a beta test. They feel a little rough around the edges. If, but now that they have time and they've had people playing this game for 10 years and they have a much better idea of how the game works and how people play it, you could revisit those optional rules and make like really well designed versions of them. You know, you could make really cool versions of those now that you have this this chance, this like second chance at them, you know, a second crack at them. But that would be a that would be a thing I'd like. And I think there's actually a good chance of that happening. I think there's a decent chance of that one happening. Let's put it this way. If I look at that optional rules section and it's the same rules printed again, I scream. <laughs> I Yeah. The thing that's going to make me scream, I know this is going to happen. It's not even an if. I know it's going to happen is the shift away from legendary actions. Yes. We, I mean, we've talked about this ad nauseum with Matt. I it's happening. hate that so I much. don't think it's as bad as you and Matt seem to think it's going to be, though. But we already there's already several things in the game that take away enemy reactions. So if it felt like this weird disjointed thing before, you're going to have these extra reactions that you're not going to be able to use because the players are going to take them away. Well, or going to reduce them in some way. So you're it's they the monsters may, are just going to be able to do less. I Unless don't they think, make it so that they can't take those reactions away, which feels kind of weird. Well, I think that. I don't know that it's going to be a situation where a player could like take all of the reactions of the monster away. I also can only think of one ability that removes reactions. All I can think of is shopping, shocking grasp, and that doesn't do that anymore. So. I was talking about it with Matt. There are apparently a couple abilities that that stop enemies from taking reactions. Uh, maybe. I mean, probably should like have done I, more research on it. I I don't remember. What, we talked about this like a couple weeks ago. It's I mean, like I said, as it could be. The only one coming to my mind is Shocking Grasp, and that had that part of its ability removed. Uh, let me see if I can. It's, I I will consult the Codex so I can find it very quick. I'm gonna. I'm in the S's. I'm buying for time as I look for the Shocking Grasp spell. I know it is in here. I will find you it. don't have to buy for time. Shocking grass. <laughs> okay, I have found it. I have found it. I have found it. Uh, huh. Lightning springs to you, springs from you to a creature that you try to touch. Uh, make a melee spell attack against the target on a hit. It takes one d8 lightning damage, and it can't make opportunity attacks until the start of its next turn. So it can use any other reactions. It just can't make op attacks. 
So that's how shocking grass works now. Hmm. Um, so they may be somewhat aware of that interaction situation and may be removing some of the like remove reaction type stuff. Uh, so there's that. And also legendary actions, although a fun idea, have always felt clunky because they feel like feel- this weird bespoke system that existed outside of all of the other systems of the game. So just tying them into a system that already exists in the game from a design standpoint makes a lot more sense. And we've already seen from the execution of, I mean, you know, I say we've already seen from looking at the legend from the, uh, ancient green dragon stat block, we can see that. Oh, and, and the Vecna stat block from a while ago, the reactions are keyed off a bunch of different things. And some of those reactions are just, when a creature finishes its turn, which is essentially all legendary action was anyway. So, you know, all you're losing, the only thing that's really changing is that a legendary action was outside of the turn order, which means it could kind of break the rules in a weird way. But I don't know that it's going to be that big of an upset if they just become reactions. Because, again, it seems like they're removing some of the take react, you know, remove reaction type abilities. And also as a react, here's here's the big one for me. If the monster's ability is a reaction as opposed to a legendary action, the monster can actively interrupt a player, which a legendary action can't do. Right. So like a player legendary actions happen at the end of of a player character, well, another character happen at the end of another creature's turn, right? So the player does their whole turn and then the monster does an action after they finish their turn. A reaction can trigger based on something a player does and actively stop them. For example, Vecna had the reaction that was called the his like uh, his what was it? Vile counter spell or whatever. He had like his special version of counter spell. And that was when a player casts his, cast their own spell, he could like counter spell with his weird ability. You can do stuff like that with other things. You could have a reaction that's like when a player character attacks you, you can do this in response. Legendary actions couldn't do that. You know, you could you could have an ability where it's like you stop the attack, you half the damage, you you know. You can do the stuff like shield where you raise your AC. You know, there's some existing stuff that players can already do. So you're kind of just shifting some of that power over to the monsters. I don't think it's going to make monsters weaker. I think it's going to make them stronger. I Yeah, I don't know. because So here's the thing. Monsters already had special reaction that keyed off stuff like that. Some of them did. But now that if we're taking all of what used to be legendary reactions and putting those into reactions, now there's going to be more of that. I, I, I genuinely feel like this is a situation where we could have the we could just have both. Like I like I, I personally never thought legendary actions were that clunky. Were well, they perfect? No, but I never thought they were particularly clunky or unwieldy or hard to like figure out. They're not that hard to figure out, but they're clunky in the sense that they're that they are they are their own little bespoke rule that kind of feels like another rule, but not exactly. So they're they're a little unintuitive upon first usage. Like I myself remember being unclear about how legendary actions worked initially. Uh, But it's not like they were, you know, it's not like they were so confusing that you like couldn't use them or anything, but they had just a little bit of a, of a jank to them because they felt like they existed in their own little bubble. So by taking them and shifting them into an existing system that sort of cleans things up a little bit. And since a big part of this whole of the whole 5e24 situation was cleaning things up, then I don't really have an issue with it. Also, you side note, you could also have, you know, you could have a rider on the reaction abilities, which is like this cannot be interrupted. You know, that's the thing, too. There's a there's a ton of just because they've become reactions does not mean they're suddenly like gimped into the ground. You know, that's that's really what no, I'm no. I mean, I, I, 
I don't think they'll be gimped into the ground by any means. I just... I, to me, personally, I think it's more intuitive to give a monster more turns and limit what those turns can do than give them a bunch of reactions. Like, I Lancer does this, where, like, where elite or ultra enemies, it just says, this character can go twice around. And then I go, oh, okay. So I, I'll put it, you know, at the top of the round and I'll put one halfway through the round so that way they'll go twice and, you know, you can do this. And then that, you know, that monster takes the place of two now on the action economy. Uh, so if you fight a dragon, for example, that's got three legendary actions. Okay, so you're like, well, it's going to have four to five actions per turn, if you, you know, assuming you're not blowing your load on the biggest one because typically they have like a one, a two, and a three. And you go, okay, well, that's how many turns is going to happen for the round. And you can sort of equal out, okay, if I hit this person for this much and this person for this much and I get hit for this much, you can part, you know, very soft math it out. That's okay, how it's always worked for me. Well, two things for that. One, I would agree with you if legendary actions were extra turns in a round, but they're not. And two, the idea of, oh, I can do this many attacks in the round is kind of still a thing if you give the monster one of those reactions just says, when a creature ends its turn, you can make this attack, which the dragon stat block did have. Um, But more importantly, legendary actions weren't extra turns. If they were just extra turns, I would agree. That would make more sense, but they weren't. They were specific actions with their own ammunition cost, which could also cause some confusion sometimes, the fact that they had essentially their own ammo cost that was diff- that was separated from everything else. And those specific actions were just like an attack. Most of the time, they were just a shitty attack, which is annoying, or like kind of a big AoE thing. They were not, this monster gets to go again. If you just said legendary monsters can take multiple turns in a round, that's now we're on a different story. That's a different story. And I have seen games do that. And that I do think is interesting. But that's not what legendary actions were doing. Legendary actions were just, ah, you're done with your turn. I will smack you now real quick. Well, well, to, uh, well to be fair, some of them were doing that. Like some of the more recent ones where it's like, oh, you can make an attack and it's like, a, you know, it, it's a dragon's bite. And you can move up to half your movement without protect, without uh, provoking attacks of opportunity. So you get a movement and a basic action. Yeah. Or it's like, okay, you like, yeah, but that's legendary still actions, not the, later the same ones as are, a full turn. It, no, it's not. But I don't, I don't think it should be a full turn. But, like, I, like, but you I just said, said like, before, you, you think it turn. should be. Well, I said a, a turn with caveats, right? With limited actions. Which is, that's pretty much what a legend action or legendary action is describing. Sort right? of. You get a sort of limited turn with limited action. Sort of, kind of. But it's still... If, if, so if still not, actions were like... It's still not that different from a reaction. And again, you can still... Nothing you're describing couldn't be done with the reactions, right? Like, there's nothing about legendary actions that make it so that a reaction couldn't do the same thing. The idea of, oh, you make an attack and then move 15 feet. Again, the re- a reaction could have that same language. Like, there's nothing stopping it from having that language. Like, no, there's nothing stopping it. But to me, I, so, A, I'm not even going to lie. I, I just feel like the reaction thing is more confusing. I think in my brain, it makes more sense to have like little wedges, like little picks that you can place into the, the action economy and be like, it's going to happen here but and here and here. I think you've ju- that's just because you've gotten used to legendary actions over the years because you've been playing with them. Like, that's just because yes, it, your it, brain it, has gotten accustomed correct, to and, that. But that doesn't necessarily mean it's correct, to it, like it, a new player that might not be more intuitive i think to a new player the idea especially with the word reaction like the word itself reaction if you're a new player you look at that that word tells me oh they are reacting to something someone else is doing that intuitively makes more sense as an interruption to the turn order than than the phrasing of legendary actions because oh they're reacting to the players and they're interrupting the players like that is more intuitive uh, see, language but, wise. But to me, that's not that's not how my brain takes it. It's like to me, it's like, OK, so you're not a new player. <laughs> no, but but neither are you in the sense that like the idea of, OK, it's a reaction. So it's supposed to interrupt an action, something that happens in the game. 
Yeah. And the reaction is when a player's turn ends, it's like, well, that's you're not really reacting to anything. There's no real reaction. You there. are. You're it's reacting just, to a turn ending. But t but reactions are typically used as a direct interference with a thing with with an active ability. But but not. I'm not turn order shifting. You're reacting to the turn order, not you're the react, players. But and I, hold, hold up. I'm not talking about reaction with a capital R here. I'm talking about reactions with a lowercase r. Like the word react means I'm responding to something that has occurred. So the end of a turn has occurred. I am reacting to the end of that turn occurring. Right? Like I'm not necessarily talking about the mechanical word reaction with a capital R in that instance. I'm yeah, saying no, I, I get that, but I, I as a to word me, intuitively. Still, Yes, I, I still think it makes more sense to just say I act after your turn in the same way that a player is making a reaction when the goblin, you know, knocks the wizard down and now they have to run over and heal the goblin. Uh, maybe, but also the name legendary actions doesn't tell me anything about like doesn't tell me that in any way. Like I'm arguing I, about I'm arguing about the language usage is what I'm saying. Like the word reaction tells me things in and of itself. It's a slightly more intuitive word to use in common. Like in, like it's a word you actually use when you talk as opposed to legendary actions, which is kind of like this gamified thing that doesn't immediately tell you what it is by its name. No, but in the inverse, like, because your I brain thought, is hardwired to think about reactions a certain way by expanding that, but, By broadening it, you go, okay, wait, is this a reaction as in I'm just going to react when the turn ends or am I interrupting? Whereas a legendary action go, it like the idea of, oh, a monster is just so cool. They get to ignore the turn order a little bit. I think that's plenty understandable. But I mean, first of all, I've, I've for start, I have literally heard people get confused about this. So I don't know if it's quite as intuitive as you're saying it feels like, but what I'm saying is you're, you're if you're a new player coming in, you don't have any assumption about reactions. The only assumption you have is just the the actual word in in literal vocabulary, which is just reacting to something occurring. I'm doing something in response to something occurring. That's all the mean. That's all the word means in like actual just normal vocabulary, whereas legendary actions is not common lexicon so you don't have any immediate understanding of what it could be but you're not coming in with any preconceived notion you're not coming in with a preconceived notion about either one of them mechanically if you're a new player because you you can't right you're a new player obviously i mean you could come in with a preconceived notion from another game maybe but from the game itself you can't come in with a preconceived notion so i think it's i think the crux of it Basically, the argument I'm making, I think it is going to be largely the same. Mechanically, it is going to work almost exactly the same as Legendary Actions. It has not shaken things up that much. It's really mostly just a language cleanup to help with learning for newer players. I really think that's what's going to come down to. I don't think it's going to feel any different. Maybe a little slightly, there might be some, there's going to be an interaction here and there where like somebody figures out like, oh, because it's technically a reaction, I could do X or Y. There's going to be some of that because that's how people play D&D. They find these goofy, these goofy interactions. But I think it's going to largely feel the same as using legendary actions. I don't think you sitting on the GM side of the screen is going to feel like this is drastically upended how this, how like a boss monster feels. I mean, we'll we'll have to find out. I don't think it will feel the same. To me, it, it's going to feel more. I think it'll feel more clunky. Uh, but again, you got to keep in mind that oh. you've gotten used to the other system being around. Like you, you, it's hard. It's hard once you've used a thing, even if something is not immediate, is not intuitive or not like well designed or whatever. If you use it a whole bunch, you get used to it. So it's it's kind of hard for you to say because you've gotten used to the other way. So, of course, it being Correct, new is going to feel I, weird in the same way that when I read how the spell, the prepared spells works. I was confused by the verbiage because my brain had gotten so used to the verbiage from before where 
spells prepared and spells known were these two bespoke mechanics. But the new verbiage isn't actually any more confusing. I just got so used to the old one that I, now I have to learn a new one, so it's not immediately obvious. So you can't, like, it's going to feel clunky to you no matter what, just because it's it's slightly different. It's different verbiage. So, like, there's no way for it to not feel a little off because your brain's still hardwired to the old verbiage until you've played with the new one for a while. You know what I mean? Like, of course, you can't, but I, uh, I'm You sort can't of also... come at it from a clean slate. It's impossible. I mean, neither of us. Can. No, it's not. It's it's not possible. But I am sort of of the opinion that it wasn't broke the way it was before. I didn't really see a need to completely overhaul it. But they didn't completely overhaul. It. That's my point. It's not completely I mean, overhauled. R- removing a bespoke mechanic like in its entirety. That's it's that's removed. Pretty... But the thing that replaced it is so similar that it really hasn't been overhauled. That's what I'm saying. Like it's such a similar thing. It's really not that. It's really not overhauled. Just because the word that the the uh, the game mechanical word legendary action has been taken out doesn't mean that it's been so that it's been totally removed. It's been sort of chopped up and put into a slightly different spot. Like it's still there spiritually. the The design, the game design, is still there. Sort of and. Honest, I mean, I don't know. It, this is also it might not the only the same. It might not, and I, it's also I don't think out. it will personally. This is not the only place they've done this either. Like a, a great example is a lot of people pointed out. Oh, the wolf stat block doesn't have the ability keen senses anymore, where they get advantage on perception checks or whatever. But instead of the keen senses ability, they just gave the wolf expertise with perception. So, effectively, it's still basically the same thing. They just chopped it up and moved it into a different spot. So there's other places where they're doing that with the game. They're sort of they're moving things around. It's still relatively the same in terms of how you're going to how you as a player are going to use it. It's the same. They just moved it around a little bit and, and adjusted the design to make it presumably with the intention of less friction. Now. Whether it will or won't be. Again, it's really hard to say whether it's actually going to be less friction as older players because we've gotten used to the old way. So there's going to be friction for us learning the new language, no matter what. Even if the new language is perfect, like it, we're still going to have that problem. So, so right. we we can't we have no way of really looking at it unbiasedly. The only way we could know is if we talk to someone who came in and is playing this year and then we could see, like, all right, how did they react to it? But you know, that's hard, obviously, especially because I don't think we have any friends who haven't played at this point. Uh, yeah, I don't think so. But yeah, I mean, it'll be interesting to figure out if it does work or doesn't. Um, we'll find out, I guess. I mean, like I said, I'm not I, my hopes are not high. I think I feel like I'm going to get confused a lot. But look, we'll I'm see. not denying that there's going to be initial confusion because there's going to be initial confusion no matter what. Like, we're going to have these moments of like, oh, this works like this. Oh, no, it doesn't quite work like that. It works like this now. That's right. That's going to happen no matter what. Like, we, I'm not no, denying no, I know. that's what, going to What I'm occur. saying is, is that I, I'm going to get confused and then I'm going to get annoyed and be like, I, I just don't like this. Right, but you just if don't I like it. If I use it enough, I'll get used to it. But right. doesn't mean I have, you like, don't like it because it's still changing. Not like it. You know, like you're annoyed because it changed and you got used to the old thing. And yeah, that's going to happen. Like, that's impossible. There's no scenario where that doesn't, no matter what change they made, you're going to have that. Like, they could have even changed it so, like, legendary action means a monster gets an entire another turn, and you still would be like, oh, yeah, right, it works like this now instead of that. You know, like, it's going to happen no well, matter no, what. See, but that wouldn't, that wouldn't annoy me, because to me, yeah, that, you like that, that, that idea, makes it But there's still going to be friction no matter what, because it's new rules, it's new language. Like, just because you like it doesn't mean it's not going to have a little bit of friction. Well, yeah, but again, it, it goes further into the that makes more sense to me. It, it goes a little bit beyond in your opinion like or dislike it. Yeah, of course, I'm talking about my opinion. Well, you're stating it very like that matter of factly. Well, because it's me. It's the only thing that, that I could. I'm not saying it makes more sense to everyone. I'm saying it, it makes more sense to me. Well, you said it makes more sense, period, which sounds much more matter of factly. Well, I mean, you cut me off. I wasn't able to say to me. <laughs> I've been letting you talk the whole time. You've never said you've been doing that the whole time. That's why I'm trying to fight. I, like, never mind. 
it's 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 gonna have the friction is impossible to avoid when things change no matter what some you may yes. some things you may look at and go okay this is less friction than something else because for whatever reason this gels in my head but it's never going to be zero no matter what no and of course not you should just give it a chance I, look i'm not saying i'm never going to use it i'm not being like no no this is stupid i'm never going to do it i mean it's kind of coming across like, that way <laughs> I don't know why I said I'm going to give it a try. I just don't think I'm going to like it. I mean, I'm like, am I going in with a preconceived bias? Yeah, absolutely. I don't think there's no way to not, but I have a feeling I'm going to run it and be like, no, nah, I like the old way more. But I just don't, I, I don't think you're looking at, I, I don't think you're looking at the design objectively enough, but that's neither here. To, that's, that's kind of that's, maybe that's, look, look full disclosure maybe maybe i mean that's possible that like I, my bias is pushing in a little too much but i'm not like i might not be as in the weeds as you are when it comes to mechanics but i have been running this game or i ran that game for four and a half years and played in it for four other ones like at this point i have a pretty solid understanding of the mechanics of the game and the minutiae even if i can't express it very well in words i know well what i am what i'm saying is like my initial gut reaction to it was not positive either, but I looked at it and went, okay, why is this change happening? And what is like, what are they doing with it? And what is the purpose? And I tried to just take any kind of opinion I have over the change out of it and analyze it from purely like, what is the objective with this design? Because that's how that's how you come to understand game design is like, what's the objective? And I, if the, the conclusion I came to is the objective of couching it in an already existing mechanic and using language that I think will probably be easier for a newer player. And that may not even be why they did it, but looking at that particular mechanic and other mechanics in the game, the things, you know, I was like, okay, this seems to be sort of lining up. And I mean, I don't know what to tell you. You're allowed to hate it, I guess, like is, is really all there is to it. But I think you should try and absorb it objectively. Like me, me pausing and looking at it and going like, what, okay, what is the purpose here is what made me realize, oh, this is, probably not as bad as my initial reaction made me feel like it was because my initial reaction was negative but i tried to look at it taking myself out of it and i said oh my negative reaction may have been a little off base especially once i looked i read the actual verbiage of each of the reaction abilities that the ancient green dragon had as opposed to just looking at like I didn't skim it. I read. I read it very carefully. Is what I'm saying. Because on, on initial skim, you're gonna get a different reaction versus like going through each sentence carefully. You know what I mean? Yeah. But you gotta. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I it's, it's just, it's, it's as simple as me being like, that's not how I would have done it. Like, it's. I read them too. I, I like, I, I, I understand what you're saying. I didn't just go. Well, I just don't feel like it. like yeah, I have a feeling that I can't get rid of. It's a gut feeling, but it's, I didn't look at it and go, no, it was like, ah, it's not how I would have done it, but it... I mean, yeah, I, I there's about, just as, about as far as it goes. Uh, not there's nothing I, I can like, say to that. Like, yeah, I just don't agree with it. <laughs> and there's no way um, for me to respond to that. <laughs> no, of course not. It's, it's a matter of opinion. You can't you, like you can't be like. The only response is either you agree or disagree, or in the why. But um, on my little on my little list. Oh, I mean, I sort of out of order. We'll do the last one first. Uh, <laughs> okay. Did the rules refresh give you any desire to run or any like any desire renewed or otherwise to run a Vivi game? To run? Uh, I don't know about to run. To play? Yeah. Run? Uh. Huh. Not yet, I guess. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'd be lying if I said I like. 
I just got out of a four year five E adjacent. I'm I'm good for now, but yeah, I mean the timing is a little. I'm curious weird. for sure. Like I'm not I'm not like no, I'll never run this edition. It's like I, well, that's just not fucking true. Like I mean I'm I teeter on that camp. Um, the the timing is a little weird, seeing as how both of us just finished a quite long year long, you know, long five E campaign. So, you know, it's the refresh. It, like if we hadn't been running anything for a year and then the refresh hit, we probably would have had a little more, a little more hutzpah, a little more get up and go. Um, but I haven't seen anything yet to indicate that running the, that running the game is going to feel drastically different. But the only book we have so far is the player's handbook. We don't have the DMG yet. I could pick up that DMG and they could have all sorts of really great advice and fixed a bunch of my like pain points and then I'll want to run it because I'm like, ah, okay, now you're like, you know, with the the DMG specifically, you are fixing my frustrations. I don't think that's going to happen because 5e is, as far as I can tell, still a player focused game and not a GM focused game in terms of its design. So I don't think it's going to, I don't think this is going to make me want to run a game and like, give me like a big get up and go to like run some more 5e. Uh, but it's, it's intrigued me enough to play 5e or to play more. I mean, I'm, we're already playing 5e. So that was, you know, but like, yes, I'm excited to play with some of the new rules. I think the thing I'm really excited more than anything else, though, isn't even. It's not even 5e itself, like 5e 24. Well, first of all, we haven't we've only seen one third of the rules of the new rules, right? Like 5e 23rd is is not out. It's one third out. We have two more books on the way and, you know, Arguably, I mean, the DMG debatable, but the monster manual is, you know, the entire other half of the game, right? Like there's the player side of the rules and like then the monster stuff like that's the two main halves of the game. So we haven't seen. We haven't seen 5e24 in the in its fullest yet. But Hmm. the thing that I'm more excited about than anything. Is not 5e is not Wizards of the Coast. It's all the third party stuff. I think the third party stuff is going to be really interesting now because the third party, like the third party companies, your Cobalt Presses, your Grim Hollow, your maybe MCDM, maybe Darrington Press, who knows if they're going to mess around with this new stuff or not. Unsure, unclear, but you know, it's on the table. You know, they're going to have this revitalization. They're going to have this new energy to be like, oh, new book, we can make new stuff. Like people are. You know, basically, they're going to piggyback off the wizard type, right? And I think what's interesting is a lot of what 5e24 has done that we've seen so far, a big crux, a lot of the changes is adding a lot more game tags and game terminology. So, you know, uh, emanations being one of the big examples, right? An aura that extends out from a character a certain number of feet in all directions. They t- they they keyworded that and made that an emanation. Um, a teammate who is on your side is now keyworded as an ally. Like that's like a mechanical term now. There's a lot of stuff they've done where they've added keywords to all these various bits of the game that kind of already existed, but they weren't totally codified. Now that they are, the third party companies can take that codification that Wizards has added and now do all sorts of cool new shit with it. So a great example. uh, I was listening to the Eldritch Lorecast and Sean Merwin was talking about how they're redesigning the transformations from Grim Hollow. Uh, Because, you know, that was a big mechanic from Grim Hollow that they made back in the early days of 5e, where you could turn into like a werewolf or a vampire or a ghoul or whatever, yada, yada. 
and they're reworking, making new, you know, 2024 versions of the transformations. And one of the things he talked about was they added a new transformation where you're called a black steel ghoul, which is like a grim hollow in universe thing. And one of the things they did was if you turn into a black steel ghoul, your character does not count as an ally mechanically for your for the other players. So you're not an enemy. You don't attack your, your you know, the other players or anything. But mechanically, you don't count as an ally, which means you don't benefit from anything that uses the keyword ally. So, like, that's a really cool minutia kind of ruling thing that they could do because of these rule changes. Um, I, if I remember correctly, the example he give, gave, and if I can see if I can find, uh, I think it was Paladin, the Paladin aura... Ink uses the word ally. If I'm remembering right. Uh, monk. Oh, geez. M before. Yes. Okay. <laughs> uh, let's see. Let's see. Paladin. Paladin. Aura of protection. Okay. You radiate a protective unseeable aura. 10 foot emanation. The aura is inactive above. You and your allies in the aura. Gain a bonus to saving throws equal to your Christmas stuff. You and your allies. So if you're one of those ghouls and you're standing next to the paladin, you're not necessarily detrimental, right? You're not doing anything to the paladin, but you can't benefit from their aura. And that's one of those rules minutiae things that's like, oh, because of this glossary section and all these word clarifications and stuff, there's a lot of cool shit that third party companies could potentially do. You know, emanations, you know, you could say like, Oh, you emanate, uh, you know, like a stench out to 10 feet and this or like or you could have like instead of an anti magic cone, you could have an anti emanation cone, right? Like everything in this zone can't activate emanations. So anything with that keyword is like turned off. But then like certain spells still work. Uh, in case you're curious, the ally in the rules grocery, a creature is your ally if a me- if if it is a member of your adventuring party, your friend on your side in combat or a creature that that the rules or the DM dis- designate as your ally. So that's the thing that I'm much more excited about. Hmm. Is seeing how other companies take this stuff and like. Mess with it, modify it, do cool shit with it, which I guess, you know, that was kind of true. There is a truth to that with 5e, you know, 2014 5e also, but. I wasn't, uh, you know, as deep in the south back then, so I wasn't paying as much attention to it. Hmm. Yeah, but in terms of am I all Jones in to run 5e? No, no, still not. Again, though, DMG still yet to come out. Could change my mind. Yeah, I mean, I, the reason why I asked is because we both just came off of games and are like a little exhausted. So I wondered yes. if new shiny thing made you go like, hmm. It's not shiny enough, (laughs) you know, fair enough, or it's not shiny enough in that particular area, I guess is a better way to put it. I mean, I don't. Are you Jones in to run another game? I don't think so, right? No. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, will I be ready to run it at some point? Most likely, like I said, like, I'm not going to say just no flat out. Like, I'm not going to play. What what does Matt call it? Uh, Five ear. Ether. Ether, yeah, whatever that is. <laughs> yep. I'm not being like, no, absolutely not. But I am still ready to like take my break. Take it for a new spin later down the road. Yeah, you know what? In the next uh in, in eight years, or, or in six years. Uh maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Why six years? Because it took me six years of playing 5e to run 5e. Oh, we got to keep this trend going. I see. I, 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 I don't know that I would recommend that trend, but all right. And in, in six years, we'll have a bunch of new cool stuff out. They'll either errata a bunch of shit away or you know, add new shit in. So who knows? Or all the new stuff will be shit. True. Which is possible. I mean, also, you never it, know. Look, it can't be more shit than uh, the idea of me being a mixed race individual being racist for existing. So, <laughs> you know. 
Let's not go down that one. I'm just, it's fine. I'm just never going to let him lift it down. <laughs> I, I know. I know. Uh, the, um, oh crap. What was I going to say? Oh, I mean, also, you never know. There could be an adventure that comes out in the next year or two there. You're like, Ooh, that's a fun one. You know, that could mm. happen. That could happen Possibly. to me too. Although less likely, but could. And uh, as a final question, uh, to the people who have, like, officially had enough of Wizards bullshit, is there any company or game that you want them to check out? Uh, the, uh, Obviously, uh, we kind of re- re- referenced the everything stuff. else. I mean, do you want me to, like, rattle off like a machine gun? Because I can. Anything that you're reading personal, like, currently that you're like, mm, this is pretty cool. I mean, I mentioned Shadow or something Dark. that will scratch the itch in the same way. Mention Shadow Dark. That's a banger. If you want some like grungier, lower magic, lower fantasy, um, D and D esque vibes, uh, Shadow the Demon Lord. If you want D and D like death metal edition, um, Dagger Heart. If you want something that's sort of has like the spiritual vibes of D and D, but none of the mechanical backing of D and D. Um, I'm I'm sticking to the fantasy things because like. You know, uh, Tales of the Valiant, if you want D&D with the serial number scratched off. <laughs> um, you know, uh, also, you know what? My boy, my boy, Kevin. Uh, Ke- oh, geez. What's his name? Not is it? Oh, geez. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. I got to look up his name. Kevin something. Kevin. It is Crawford. OK, uh, my boy, Kevin Crawford. If you want to look up stars without number, worlds without number and cities without number. Uh, those games are fucking sick. Stars Without Number is sci-fi, Worlds Without Number is fantasy, and Cities Without Number is cyberpunk, and they all use the same base system, which is essentially based on old second edition D&D basic rules. It's a sort of more, slightly more modern version of D&D basic rules. Uh, and those games I particularly love because Kevin Crawford put a lot of energy into making sure that the GMing side of the game, which is the thing I was just complaining about with D&D, the GMing side of the game is like really awesome. Like you have a ton of really good GM tools. Uh, and uh, so yeah, the without numbers games and uh, you know, fucking play apocalypse world and dungeon world just cuz you know yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah i mean as for my thoughts on it uh oh i guess keep an eye out on draw steel mcdm's game that's not out but it's you know do i, I look fucking hate for that game i hate the name too but if you want to look towards the future draw steel yeah i mean i i would say Check out Fabula Ultima. Pretty cool. You want some weeb shit in your life. Yeah. Oh, and it, yes, it's some weeb shit, but it feels like a pretty like it feels like Final Fantasy one, like pretty, which is pretty standard. I think so. Yeah. Final it's Fantasy got, one it's, is it's very D&D on its sleeves. Like it is, but it's it's the weeb version of D&D. I Mick fucking guess. Like it's it's in the same way that Dragon Quest is like you know the very Japaneseified kind of fantasy idea you know like same thing. That's not a bad thing. I'm just it's just it just is. What else would I recommend? Uh, I mean, uh, I don't know if I'd recommend. Va- I mean, if you're if you <laughs> if you're a fucking theater kid. And you got into D&D because you were friends with other theater kids who were like, it's about the role. It's about the acting. Just play uh, play anything World of Darkness. I promise I, you, you will have a better time. I mean, I guess I sort of. Yeah, I mean, the lore is there. That's for sure. Jesus Christ. And the. Uh, and deny the world building. No, no. It's about the acting. It is. It is about the. I mean, listen. They call the GM the storyteller. I think that tells you a lot. Yeah. Look. Look. 
it, VTM is for theater kids. It's not, I'm not, this is not like, I'm not being mean or bullying. This was made for you. <laughs> the fucking writers for this game were like playwrights and theater kids. Run uh, <laughs> I believe they were novelists, but yeah. yeah At that. least the original, the original designers. I don't know about these days. And, um, I don't know. Lancer's really cool. You should play Lancer. <laughs> Lancer's very cool. It's very not D&D. It's, 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 you know, Mecha, big robots and nonsense. But. but it could be like D&D if you play in Kerrigan Space. Actually, when you play in Kerrigan Space, it's like Powered by the Apocalypse. It's literally Powered by the Apocalypse. It's a, yeah. Weird thing they did. It is a little bit weird. Uh, yes. Two, two games kind of stacked on top of each other. <laughs> but... Uh, That's a... I was keeping to the fan. It. Listen, I was keeping to the fantasy things mostly because if I start going out the fantasy realm, I got all this other crap. You were just talking about stars without number. You said it before worlds without number. Well, well, I, I was well, because stars without number was the first game in the without number games. But the reason I mentioned all three of them is because they all kind of come as a package. They're all the same system, like at its core. Yes, I. I know that it, yes, stars that number is technically sci-fi, but it was the first in that like series of games. Gotcha, gotcha. All right, I think that's about it. That's all I got. Um, anything you want to tell them before we go? You get to feed your animals and call your grandma. Yeah, uh, walk your cactus and wash your fish. Water your fish. Oh, yeah, yeah. Water. That's very important. Also, follow us on Twitter. Yeah, we haven't nuked that yet, but we're contemplating. I, you joke. I was I actually legitimately. What, thinking of nuking our like our, our podcast Twitter? Maybe. Or at least, well, nuking is a strong word. Never, never mind. Do not discuss it.